Hello, everyone. Hi, it's Cricket Song with Lunar Wisdom. Tonight's live stream was scheduled to be me and a co-host, Jasmine Ambrosia. However, due to weather conditions, um, Jasmine was stuck in transit. Now, if she happens to pop over uh, into... Um, the chat, I will invite her into the stream and have her on tonight. Uh, however, in the meantime, and in case she is unable to make the live stream, I figured since I haven't done a video in a while, I'd come live anyway. So I'll be taking questions if you are in the chat. Hi, Shadow Sun. Um, if you're in chat, and you have some questions for me, I'd be more than willing to answer your questions for you. Uh, but I figured I'd start the chat or the conversation tonight with an email question that I had gotten this week uh, from a viewer. I'm not going to tell you who the viewer is. I'm just going to, you know, discuss the question. The question was dealing with familiar spirits. Um, and the question was, uh, is it possible if my pet dies to make their spirit my familiar spirit? Or is it is there a ritual that I could share for them to do this? Is it even possible to do this? Um, and I'd like to start, you know, the discussion with this topic. Now, I do have some videos here on my channel, you can look at the, you know, the backlog of videos. I have 400 plus videos where I do discuss familiar spirits. I also discuss this topic in my book, Becoming Witch. There's a uh, chapter titled Familiar and Unfamiliar Spirits. It's um, chapter six. Um but basically, I, I want to start this with defining what a familiar spirit is. And a familiar spirit is a spiritual entity that works with the witch to, you know, there is a relationship there. There is a, um, there is a uh, sort of a give and take. There is, it's a relationship that the witch has with a spiritual entity a spirit because a spirit as, and, and again, this is my definitions, my opinions, my perspective, a spirit is a non-physical being. Okay. So when we talk about the spiritual realm, we're talking about a realm that is not physical. It's spiritual in nature. So a spirit is a non-physical entity. So it's not a human being. It's not an insect. It's not an animal. A spirit is made of, you know, ethereal. It's, it's, it's pure energy. It's energy. A familiar spirit, therefore, is a spirit that the witch is familiar with. You know, there's that, it, there's also a feeling of family, you know, famil familiar, that kind of, um, that kind of, um, I guess, definition. Uh, excuse me for one moment. I do believe I have a message from Jasmine asking, can we still do a live? I'm almost home. Okay. Um, I will send her, give me a moment. I will send her the link so she can join me. Sorry, I will to invite her. <clears throat> let me just let her know what's going on. We just sent her the link, letting her know that she can join as soon as she returns home. Okay, so 
so the spirit, the familiar, the familiar spirit um, is a spiritual entity in its own right. Now, the each of us, each human being, animal, depending on your belief, but in my belief, every living being is comprised with a physical aspect and a spirit. You know, it's the spirit is part of what animates the physical vessel. So, Jasmine, I sent you the link whenever you're ready. You could just click on the link and join in and I'll add you to the stream. Um, so an animal, your pet, um, has a spirit animating the physical vessel, right? So the familiar spirit that works with the witch is a different spiritual entity or a different spirit than the spirit that animates your animal, your pet. So when your pet dies, I believe there's this process that all living beings go through, just like there is a birthing process, there is a death process. I suppose <laughs> you could take the spirit of your pet and make it a familiar spirit for you to work with. But the connotation to me is like you're forcing the spirit to be something it's not. Uh, you already have a relationship with your pet. Um, and I believe that that relationship can still flourish after the death of your pet, but that's going to be a different relationship than the relationship a witch has with a familiar spirit. In my own experiences, the familiar spirit has always been a spiritual entity. It was never a physical being. It, you know, my human uh, family and friends that have passed on, I would categorize them as my beloved dead. They're individual spirits that have lived a human experience and have transitioned and agreed to work with me from beyond the, beyond the veil. In the same way, I believe our pets can do the same. They, they would be a part of our beloved dead where the familiar spirit has a different perspective because that familiar spirit was never manifested in physical form. So this individual who was asking the question, this viewer was suggesting that, you know, maybe there is a way or asking if there is a way to take a beloved dead, which would be my pet, you know, alchemy or my pet bandit or my pet bird, pretty boy or whatever. And, and, shift that relationship. And I think it, it would be, I suppose you could, I mean, I guess anything is possible, but from my perspective, it's not something that I would desire. And it's not something that makes me feel comfortable because again, I, I don't command spirits. You know, I know there are magical practitioners that do command spirits. I don't command spirits. Um, I would command a servitor uh, but that is a spiritual entity that I've created. It's a thought form that I created to do my service, to do my bidding. I'm not a witch who, you know, summons or evokes or invokes spiritual entities to do my bidding. It's more of a working relationship where there is a give and take in that relationship. So for me, if I were to, you know, say my dog Sophie here, dies and for me to do a ritual or cast a spell in order to have Sophie's spirit become a familiar spirit, I feel like there's more of a servitude there. Uh, it's almost like, you know, forcing her to do my bidding where the familiar spirit that I'm, you know, 
uh, used to working with is a spiritual entity that I have built a relationship with that is a spiritual entity and has always been. So I don't know of any rituals or spells to cast to change that relationship and sort of force that spirit into my, my service. I mean, I'm sure I could do research and find one, but, um, I don't know any offhand and I would be uncomfortable doing that for myself. Um, hello, Nicole. Um, and Jasmine says she is going to be joining in a few minutes. Um, what are your thoughts for those of you? There's a handful of people uh, watching. Um, what are your thoughts in regards to a familiar spirit? Um, if you are a witch or a magical practitioner, do you have one that you have a relationship with? And number, the, the next part of that question is, um, what are your thoughts on having a pet die and then, uh, I guess, um, making them or, or, or uh, casting a spell or doing a ritual in order for them to become your familiar spirit? What are your, what are your thoughts in regards to that? And let me pull my book out and see um, what other points I might want to make in regards to the familiar spirits. Um, let's see. Um, you know, I mean, the whole idea uh, about I guess, spiritual entities, we can keep ch chatting about spiritual entities. Um, because as which many of us work with the spiritual realm, right? We work with our beloved dead, we work with spirit allies, familiar spirits, the ancient ones, the gods, the ancestors, um, your, maybe your ancestors, if you separate them from the beloved dead, uh, or your beloved dead, there is a, um, and then there is many other spiritual entities that reside in the spiritual realm that, you know, you may or may not um, have relationships with that when you are <clears throat> working on the spiritual realm, you may come in contact with. And it's definitely an important thing for the witch to be able to identify, uh, maybe not necessarily who the specific spirit is, uh, but to identify whether the spiritual entity is one that is, you know, um, friendly or working with that spiritual entity would benefit you as which, or is it a spiritual entity that is maybe detrimental to you as which. And I think you know, being able to discern the difference between the energies of a friendly spirit and an unfriendly spirit would be important for you as which to be able to at least identify whether it's an energy that makes you feel comfortable or an energy that makes you feel uncomfortable. And I think, you know, working with energy would help the witch to be able to, you know, identify these types of energies, you know, so I would encourage anyone from um, seeking to, you know, start in witchcraft or looking to work with uh, the spirit realm, if it's not something that you've done uh, to work with energy to definitely feel the different frequencies or the different vibrations that different living beings and non-living beings uh, resonate, you know, how you align with that energy. How does your energy merge uh, with that energy? If it merges at all, is it like oil and water or is it like um, two water-based uh, liquid substances and, and how they can, you know, mixed and meld and merge and, and what happens and how, how does that 
you know, when you align with a certain vibrational frequency, how does that make you feel? You know, is that something that um, you want to explore further, you know, and that sort of enables us to get a greater perspective and a greater understanding of whatever is holding that energy. And I think, you know, the easiest way to begin to learn how to do that kind of thing is to go out, you know, in nature and experience the elements, you know, and, and feel the energy of a tree, feel the energy of, you know, the grass, the concrete, the dirt, the water, the sand, all the different things, all the different uh, forms that nature has, you know, walking through the forest feels different than, you know, swimming in a pond, which feels different than walking on the sand, which feels different um, than climbing a, or hiking a mountain, you know, all these things feel differently to us. And being able to identify your energy from these different, you know, entities or beings or aspects would definitely help you to then, you know, when you start working with spiritual entities, be able to identify what your energy is and the differences between yours and these other spiritual entities. So Jasmine is here. So I'm going to add her to the stream. Yay. Hi. Hello. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sorry that I'm kind of late. That's okay. Please. I was just sort of taking questions um, because I figured I'd like to have a whole hour for our actual discussion. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to jump into that because I think it's going to take longer than an hour. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, and I don't know how much you caught, but we were talking about familiar spirits and a question I had gotten from a viewer through email. Um, did you hear the question? Yeah, I was kind of listening to it. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? I, I mean, I agree completely uh, with most of what you said, you know, talking about familial spirits never really being like having a cat familiar. It's not really a cat spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more of like a guide or an astral being in a physical form. That's kind of how I take it. Um, and I also think too, and it's just kind of funny that you were talking about this um, because like on my way home, I literally just walked in the door. So where I live right now, there's like a flash blizzard happening. And I live about 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes from where I work. And, um, you know, we probably should have closed our shop a little bit early today, but I had a couple of last minute clients that I ended up I mean, they uh, didn't come in person. We did a tele-session like this. And I was already at the store. So I was like, well, since the roads are bad, I might be late to their appointment if I try to get home and do their session. I'm safe here. Let me just do it here. And um, I have a lot of anxiety sometimes with driving because of accidents that I've been in uh, before in the past. And the roads, I mean, it's bad. Like it's below freezing we have we've accumulated close to six inches of snow in like just the past two hours freezing rain whole nine yards um you know and I don't have the best I mean my car's great and I love my car and after my last accident we've all jokingly named because we name inanimate objects here in this household and so we've called her prana as like life she's like my new life you know and um so I put in the gps and this all comes back full circle, I promise. But I put in the GPS, like my address to get home and everything and to avoid the highways because there's been so many accidents on the highway. Like people are at a, stand, a standstill. So it's either I take my chances on the highway and possibly get stuck there for a couple of hours, um, which part of the way home I had to. But then I went into the GPS and I was like, okay, the way home without interstates. And But the back roads are super bad too. So talking about like, familial spirits or working with spirits kind of in that same topic, but not quite. I noticed that um, in my car, like hanging around um, my, re my rear view mirror, I have one of my mom's like chains. And so I just like very instinctually just like 
took the chain, like it's a necklace chain. I just took it off of the rear view. And as I was driving, I was just holding it, you know, and just like channeling. I mean, I'm a grown out, I'm a grown woman. I'll put it that way. Um, I won't be exploitative or whatever, but sometimes you still need your mommy, you know? And I was just like freaked out driving on those roads. And I was just, for me holding the chain, it created kind of like a, a mental effect. And I really do feel like, you know, she was with me and I could kind of hear her in that way, you know? And, uh, but yeah, working with like familial spirits, I feel like there's also the idea that there are spirits and for me, and in my opinion, attach also to like inanimate objects. And um, so tying this all back in, if I seem a little like razzle dazzled, it's just because I just <laughs> got in the house and my husband made me a cocktail to like soothe my nerves a little bit. But um, yeah, I think that inanimate objects also carry with them, you know, spirits that are either innate and natural to the item. Like this chain was a chain that my mother wore frequently. There's many photos of her wearing it around her neck. Um, but I also think that spirits, even not ancestral spirits, but just astral spirits like this cat familiar that I'm using as an example, could also be placed onto objects. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. But what do you think about um, someone having their pet dies and then the witch taking the spirit of their dead cat or dog and not like making them their familiar. Hmm. Yeah. I think I remember you talking about that a little bit. I think. Because that was the question. The question from this viewer was, did I know a ritual or a spell that could be used to take a dead pet and make them their familiar, the witches. Well, I think that the spirit from the dead pet could very much be a guide, mm -hmm. could very much be an astral companion for like astral traveling and, you know, things like that. But I don't think, I mean, if the pet was not a, famil a familiar in life, I don't see how it would become a familiar in death um, because it just isn't, it just simply isn't. And like, I think the idea of like trying to force it, I mean, that's kind of like trying to force, like, I don't know, your, your dog into being a cat. Like, it's just not <laughs> what it is fundamentally. Yeah. And I guess, you know what I was just thinking as you were talking, I guess it really comes down to an individual's definition of what a witch is familiar is, you know, I guess if someone um, believes that, you know, a witch's familiar or their familiar is their pet, their spirit of their pet, I guess it, it could be. That's not my definition, um, but maybe it is someone else's. I mean, I think that your dead pet could very much still be a guide. I agree. Both. Like, yeah. I believe that. And yeah. I think that you could still work with the spirit of your pet, I but agree. I don't, I don't feel like that's really possible. Yeah. Yeah. Does any, and I asked anybody, I mean, there's a handful of people watching. Anybody have any, uh, other than this question, I wanted to just start the conversation um, in this, uh, with this live stream with that question. But if anybody in chat has a question in regards to magic, witchcraft, paranormal uh, experiences, uh, I'm open for that. Um, Amy agrees, uh, definitely in life, but not in death or, yeah. Um, any questions, anyone? Questions? Jasmine, you have any questions that you'd like to discuss? Uh, I know we have a couple of topics we wanna have videos for in the future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I recently, just um, not on my channel, but on Patreon, there's a whole thing going on right now with like, and this is like, I feel like a very reoccurring trend and like a very big theme that I see at least in occult spaces online is like the whole, how do I know if I'm cursed? I don't even want to, I don't even know if we want to like open Pandora's <laughs> box on that one. Cause there's a lot there, but that I guess is kind of what's on my mind recently. Not that I feel right now, not that I'm saying I feel like I'm cursed, right, but right. I've had several people from Patreon cause I've been making 
some left hand path content and I've been making some specifically baneful magic, you know, exploring creative curse work is what I like to think of it as. And um, so because of that, I've had several people from my channel, but also from Patreon kind of want to know like, well, how would I know if I'm cursed? I don't even know if, I mean, that's such a big topic. So I don't know if we're going to get it into is. it. It is. Um, but, you know, it is interesting that it comes around every so often. Anyway. It does. And then there's also kind of like the secondary question to that, that if I am cursed, how do I like understand the origin of the curse? Right. You know, cause we have like, and when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about curses. I'm not talking about like jinxes or hexes, which I don't even think is the same thing. Um, so like just understanding that. And I think that there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the time we have, well, I mean, I guess we could kind of, we could kind of get into it and always do another more in depth thing. I mean, I guess, so, so then, um, I would first suggest that we talk about how we define curse, hex, jinx, of so course. that we know the difference between the three. And I know I've talked about it in the past. I know you have. I know I've done a live with other people in regards to the three um, definitions as well. Um, but just for the purpose, for anybody tuning in, um, how would you describe or how would you define what's the difference between the three? Okay. Well, I think, I think that you and I have talked about this before too. And I think yeah. that we very much are of the same we are. <laughs> idea of this, but um, I would say that. So with a hex, I look at that as magic for positive or negative yep. being placed upon somebody else, you know? Um, so I don't believe that hexes are always necessarily specifically baneful. I, I, agree. Think, I think that a hex is just, pushing your will, pushing your magic on somebody else. Right. I mean, in a way, maybe you could hex yourself, I guess. But I, I look at it more as like what we do externally versus internally. Yeah. Uh, like, you could, for, like, like, for example, my example on that is uh, the Amish hex signs that they used to put on their barns. They, they weren't putting that on their barns for a bad purpose. That was more like a blessing um, to they would decorate. The, it's like a sigil, um, but it's a hex mark. And it was a blessing of protection on the barn and on the animals in the barn. That's a hex, but it's not a baneful hex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think hexes could theoretically well, be. Of course baneful. they could. You know, I mean, magic can be this or that, but I just think of it as just a very general word for put it, pushing magic onto someone else or maybe a place too. Right. A jinx exactly. to me is very petty. Like jinxes to me are the definition of shade and pettiness like versus curses to me are much more like severe. So to me, a jinx would be baneful for me. It would, but it would be more like not as intense, like in the sense that like maybe you hit every single red light on your way to work or oh, like, really? okay. Or like when you wake up in the morning, you know, may the cat piss on your floor. So your socks get soaked with urine, like jinxes okay. to me are more like using luck or fate against somebody and twisting fate or twisting luck to not favor this person. I don't necessarily think that's the same thing as the curse. To me, a curse is definitely, and I think there's degrees within curse work too, but to me, a curse is much more primal and baneful. See, I don't even use the word jinx in my own practice because whenever I think of jinx, I think of more root work stuff. And I think of a different, so a different type of witchcraft altogether. <coughs> So, I mean, for me, a curse is, although I, anytime I would want to send harmful intent to someone, I don't think it, I don't, I wouldn't define it as petty. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it definitely is baneful. Yeah. And I, I don't, don't think, curse I don't someone think in a good way. <laughs> I don't think curses are petty. I think that curses, you know, are very, have a severity to them that mm -hmm. for me, when I use jinx, jinx is dull. And I also think of jinxes as being much more folk magic based. Mm. And I think of curses as being like more ceremonial and ceremonial in the sense that we're working with astral <laughs> or cosmic forces. Okay. We're not just working with stuff of the land. Oh, okay. So yeah, because for me, I don't use jinx in my vocabulary when I'm doing baneful magic. Anything I do that 
baneful that I want to cause harm would be a curse in my definition. Uh -huh. Whether I'm using, whether I'm using the forces of nature, whether I'm using the synchronicities of the universe, um, I generally, it's either, you know, a curse or, um, or, a, I guess, a, 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 a beneficial magic, you know, uh -huh. for me, that's my definitions. Uh -huh. But I do think we're both agreeing that curses are definitely baneful and jinxes. If you, if you do that sort of thing are, are baneful as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then how do, how do I know if I'm cursed? Yeah. I just, yeah. I was kind of talking about this the other night and I think it's interesting because I feel like the thing, and we're just talking about like hardcore, baneful, malevolent magics here. Okay. So the petty stuff or everything else, we'll just table that because we're talking about like serious malevolence and harm, bodily injury and illness, like of the physical, the digital, the astral, mind, body, and spirit. Mm -hmm. That's what we're addressing here now. So I think um, the way curses can be set up, for one, in my opinion, they're going to be sculpted and shaped by the practitioner. So yep. like, hypothetically speaking, if this was like some sort of game of chess, or if we were just witches wanting to just have a little bit of fun with some poor unfortunate soul, um, I think that the way you would curse someone if you chose to, and the way that I would, would be different. And the spirits yep. that we did or didn't incorporate would be different. And yep. maybe the signs, seals, or omens of the curse could also be very different. But yep. as a general stance, I think of, you know, nightmares. I think of, you know, physical ailments. I think of strings of bad luck. I think of culturally recognized bad omens, which I think is kind of like, a gray area because for some people flocks of black birds are a really negative omen and in some cultures that's really bad but there's plenty of witches who view that as like their deity communicating with them or so I think that it's kind of up to the practitioner and the individual who thinks that they might be more often than not though I feel like you're probably not cursed more often than not I agree um and if anything I think it's a curse that you kind of speak over yourself like more often than not, like, oh, every time I look in the mirror, I hate this. I hate that. I pick this apart. I pick that apart. I will never be good for that. Or I'm going to surround myself with people who can't, who are incapable of loving me the way I want to be loved because I subconsciously believe I'm unlovable. Right. More often than not, I think that those curses are more likely to be than like a practitioner seriously is upset. And I mean, not to rule it out, because sure. I very much am a believer in that, but yeah. So I would think of physical ailments, ailments of the physical variety, the mental variety, the spiritual variety, things breaking around you. Um, you know, like maybe picture frames falling off the wall, your car not starting, you're losing your hair, you're breaking out with acne, you're suffering with fertility issues, you're having mishaps in your relationships, you can't communicate properly to your spouse or your children. You're losing your job or you're getting in trouble at work. Like can't pay the rent, can't pay the bills. Yeah. All types of things like that. But it has to be like multiple of those. If yeah. you just tick one of the boxes, you know, you might not be cursed. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. I also think that it's so important to, if you really do think that, either practice some divination yourself or go to someone. But you feel like you can be confidential with who's detached from your life. Like I personally, you know, being in a metaphysical store, there's like five people off of the top of my head that I could think of who I would feel comfortable reading my cards. But I might go to like some witch in a totally different city or something. Right. Who's super detached from the whole equation. You know? Yeah, but that you, tr also that you trust, I think, yeah. too, um, because I am sure I have known witches or witches who would tell you, you go to them, they'll tell you whether you're cursed or not. More likely, they're going to tell you you're cursed, and then they're Charge going to easy. sell yeah. you something to remove that curse. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I agree. Divination, I think, is number one. Um, 
when I have clients that come to me and ask and come to me with a concern that they're cursed and they're coming to me, so-and-so referred me to you because they said you helped them. I am, I know I'm cursed by so-and-so. Um, can you remove the curse for me? First off, I don't take their word for it. Divination is the first thing to uh -huh. be found. The uh -huh. very first thing, very first thing. Because why do all that work if it's not even necessary? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I also think with answering kind of the other question of like, how do we understand the curse's origin? If that really is the case, then, you know, kind of take into account these things. Like, you know, if you're having these horrible nightmares and there's something featured in the nightmare, or if you keep having a reoccurring feeling or thought, kind of take inventory of that and then take that to the divination and see if this is connected and see if these are signs of the curse and then reverse it yeah. through whatever way that you feel is best for you, whether it's a return to sender, an RTS sort of situation, or whether it's kind of just like a block cleanse clear situation, like, I know some witches who they'll throw it right back. I know some witches right. who will transmute that energy into something else. And I know some witches who will just straight up suffocate the actual work being done and it just dies. Right. So, and I think, you know, knowing the origin of the curse, I mean, it's my opinion that if you're cursed, you generally have an idea of the people who would want you to be cursed, generally. I well, mean, I you know, like, when yeah. we piss people off, that we pissed someone off. I mean, well, when I'm saying origin, too, I'm thinking kind of in two ways. One, the origin of who sent it, but mm -hmm. two, what is it? Oh, what kind of curse? Yeah. Like, how is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I think knowing how the curse was sculpted or created, or at least having an idea of what elements and variables you know, might've been used. Cause I mean, there's so many different ways to curse. There's so many different of types of curses. So mm -hmm. I think knowing that part kind of helps you unravel it or do whatever you want with it. Get, Cause it takes the power out of it to a degree. And I feel like you're able to re-sculpt that. Right, right. I guess it would really even depend on what, whoever's gonna do, help you undo it or send it back, how they're going to approach it. Because, you know, if they're going to just send it back, it may not be necessary to really, depending on, again, uh, depending on the witch that's going to sort of cancel it, stuff, however they're going to do it. Um, it may not be 100% necessary to know how it was sculpted to begin with if they're just going to reflect it back, you know. Although, honestly, if it's a good curse, it's going to be difficult. <laughs> I think that's part of the fun of it, too. Yeah. Because it's yeah. kind of like it's kind of like a puzzle, you know, and I think, too, like a, a witch who's more used to or comfortable with that. Typically, there's like almost like little Egyptian booby traps set up in place to where like it makes it more difficult. You don't just throw All out right. full intention. You know, exactly. you have to layer it, maybe of do course. it on the dark. Yeah, like do it on a dark moon or maybe put an additional um, jinx or curse over this to where they have a hard time uncovering it. I think one of the stupidest things and something that I see occasionally in some of the witchy groups I'm in on Facebook, you know, the witchy groups. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a witchy group, but I'm not love, one of those witchy groups. No, 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 no. I love, I love the witchy groups. No, I'm not saying it that way. I love the witchy groups, but I'm just saying, like, it's always something in these yeah, groups. it is. Someone's always having a dream. Someone always thinks, you know, just, I'm seeing 444. Four, four. What does it mean? Four times a day. You know what I mean? Like, just, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. So I'm not diminishing the power of these groups at all. I think they're great. But every once in a while... And this is a very fascinating psychological thing to me. Um, I have a receipt I can send you later of what I'm talking okay. about. Um, maybe you've already seen it. But every once in a while, someone will like have something show up like on their car or their front doorstep and they take a picture of it and they're like, oh, am I cursed? You know, like there's one where like someone there's like snow on this person's car and this person like drew an inverted pentagram in the snow, like over the car. And then it looks to me, I was sharing it with some friends. To me, it looks like red candle wax or maybe wine. It's kind of hard to tell, 
but like someone else like in the comment section of course everyone's like blood magic and just like going like nutso about it and then there's a whole ritual dagger like a whole thing sitting in the center of this and like i don't know i just had the feeling that this person placed this whole thing there themselves you know and i think sometimes that is the case but i've also seen other stuff where there's like six dead frogs dead and sewed together and thrown on someone's doormat you know to me that's more of a fear tactic and i think someone really looking to hurt you wouldn't want to give you the slightest clue something like that i think that's more of a fear tactic and i also think that's more often than not used by people who aren't even practitioners who are like oh let's let's put a pentagram on this because that's scary you know i think when i think of it you know I think crafting a curse that is multi-layered, but is also uh, like you were saying, like if someone is having, like if they have negative feelings about themselves, I mean, good curse, I think, would incorporate that person's own insecurities. Oh, absolutely. Their own fears. Uh, I do think for me personally, a good curse includes a little bit of fear because then fear is going to breed more insecurity and more insecurity is going to, it's like, all I need to do is plant a seed mm -hmm. uh, and then this person will just perpetuate it and it will build and just keep going. And then I can just be like, bye. And they, it just keeps going. Um, and then it gets difficult to, try to unravel that because then this person has put their own shit in it. Yeah. So then, I mean, so some fear, some, well, fear. and then interest, like I also think too, sometimes curses designed like that, they go on past oh, yeah. and they become in my perspective, generational. generational. I know someone was just asking, um, what about, uh, what about something that is a generational curse? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, what is that saying? Um, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Oh, yeah. But in doing something like that, your enemy is then going to know more about you. And well, I, think it's a, I, think it's that. I think it's a tight, I think it's a tight line. You know what I mean? It is. I mean, for myself as a practitioner, I don't know, maybe part of me, it's like, I kind of want to see them fall. You know what I mean? Like uh -huh. part of me. So like, I don't want to just completely wash my hands with it and block them and walk away from them in the physical, the digital, and the astral. I want to be kind of on the sidelines, maybe not right. directly mixing. It, with right. Person, right. But keep them close enough in my vision in the physical, the digital, and the astral to where I can see them crumble and be brought down right. to their knees and right. be humbled. You know what, what I, I mean? What I, what I mean by like, you know, cast throw the curse and walk away meaning that i don't have to keep feeding it oh yeah oh, yeah be a spectator be a spectator and if need be you know the little occasional poke however you do that i very much know. i very much agree and i also think too like another topic about left hand practice and astrology is like Natal charts are so great. I read natal charts, love a natal chart, love casting charts, love doing astrology, love that it's become more trendy and more information is more accessible. Love teaching classes about it. Can we stop wearing our full natal chart though as a necklace for the whole world to see? I don't particularly love that. I think that it's a cute idea. I kind of like the idea more of like, you can also get what the night sky looked like or the full moon looked like mm -hmm. on your birthday. I kind of like that more because a natal chart is so personal. And the two heavy planets of the main planetary factors within a chart, you know, Pluto and Saturn, Pluto kind of being like, this is kind of what's dead in the chart or where death is in our chart per Western astrology, my understanding, how I've learned it. Pluto is kind of what's dead in the chart. Saturn is kind of what's blocked or restricted in the chart. So if you take that into account with the houses, first house, house of self, fourth house, house of family, seventh house, house of marriage, 10th house, house of work and career, eighth house, the house of the witch, 12th house, house of psychic abilities. Do you need everybody and their mother to know that like you're astrologically speaking, kind of having struggles or death in your marriages and relationships? I don't think so. Because I think if someone 
wanted to incorporate more high magic, ceremonial magic, whatever, they could work with planetary forces like, oh, okay, she's got a Saturn in her fourth house. That means that she's got a lot of abandonment and family issues. Huh. Yeah, exactly. So, to kind of piggyback off what you said, I totally agree. And I think they can become self-fulfilling too. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Um, all right. We prayed to the goddess and buried the body. Oh, oh, someone had, um, hi Ruby. Um, someone, hey Death Summer. Hi Ari, which is Ruby. Hey Amy. Uh, Amy had a question. Do you, uh, do we do you mind if we take this question? Kind of inter interject it in the. Oh yeah, absolutely not. I mean, yeah, totally. Okay, so Amy has many pets and discovered a cat that had died over the last Midwest winter on my property. My teenage daughter wanted to keep the skull in a reverent way. What's your opinion? Absolutely. Yes. Me too. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I actually um, yeah, I think that what a good way for that to be reverent, I think might kind of like depend. I also like, they said teenage daughter, right? Yeah. I mean, where, I don't know. I think, you know, your kid best and you know, their maturity level best. Um, but necromancy or taxidermy or bone articulation. Um, I mean, it can be, I'm sitting right here with a jar of goat eyeballs and a baby goat's tongue preserved in a jar. And I have, it's a black Spanish goat skull right over here. Like that. Okay. Anyway, my point here is it can get, it can be messy. And I think that if this, if this was just like a stray cat or a random cat, that might be maybe a little bit easier than like, if this was your extension yeah. of your family for the past 12 years. Yeah. I mean, I think I personally would have a hard time working on my pug's corpse. Yeah. You know, like our pug sleeps with us and it's like my four legged baby. I think I would have a much harder time emotionally and psychologically working on that than I did this goat that was already butchered. You know what I mean? Like I. I can't hear you anymore. I don't know. I was just getting a phone call. So I don't know if we got disconnected there or not, but. Nope. Um, yeah, so absolutely, I think that would be a great way. And, um, you know, there's a couple different ways, I think, to do so. I've definitely learned the hard way a lot because I first started trying this with roadkill in order to honor the spirits of the land that I live on, especially around springtime. And I've had so many corpses taken from me, like from nature spirits or raccoons or birds of prey, scavengers. So, um the, the issue with burying the dead animal and allowing it to naturally decompose. I think that's the preferred way for a lot of witchy necromantic taxidermists. Cause that's the natural way. Um, but the issue I've had with that is it getting taken from me. So getting like, depending on the size of the animal, a dog cage where um, you can put it inside of there and allow the bugs to crawl in, but it can't be taken out. I've heard is a really good way, but then there's also like, it is decomposition. There is going to be pus. There's going to be maggots. What kind of stomach, you know, where are you going to put it on your property? You know, here at our house, we have a pretty big backyard. So if I tuck it way, way, way back in the back and kind of gate it up, it's really not an issue. But then there's also the idea that if it's fresh, if it's fresh and hasn't started really significantly decomposing, um, you can bag it up and put it in your freezer. I've done that before. So no, think of it no differently in my eyes as like buying some meat from the butcher and you're putting it in the freezer and then letting it thaw out. And then what I actually did with the baby goat was I boiled it until it fell, until all of the meat and everything fell off the baby goat, like a rotisserie chicken. That took me about four hours just for that portion. So what would you say? Uh, I don't have a problem keeping a skull in a in a reverent way, but like you said, the teenage daughter, it, or is it daughter? She said, yeah, it depends on the age. And like you said, you know, your child best, whether they are really looking at it as something sacred or whether it's just 
fun and trendy, I think. Um, but I do think, I mean, if you're going to bury, I've buried animals in my backyard. I don't have a problem with that. I wouldn't know what to do and how to keep the skull. I'd have to ask someone um, how to do it. So, you know. Well, I think some of that's kind of the fun, the fun kind of part of it too. And I think it could be a really wonderful opportunity, you know, if you think that your kid is mature, you know, for this, I think it also is a wonderful lesson in decomposition and anatomy and like learning about different muscles and where they're placed and what they do. Like it could very much be turned into a, a, a teaching moment. Cause I know that for me working on the go, I was like, wow, this is kind of, I had no idea what their tongues felt like, you know, like I had never really been up close to a goat before. So yeah, I think that it can very much be academic as well as yeah. spiritual. Oh, I agree. I agree. I mean, like, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to do. I'd have to learn what to do. All the skulls that I have have been gifts from other individuals and they've already been just skulls at the time that I've received them. So yeah, I don't have a problem. I would, I would, I would love to have a cat skull. Mm, okay. That was a good question. It was. Uh, what do we got here? No, yeah, it was this no collar, no tags. Yeah, I kind of feel like if it was more of like a stray, it might be a little bit easier. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that whole thought too. Because I don't know, I mean, I've had two cats die, and I emotionally, I don't think I could go dig them back up. I've thought about it. But I don't know. I don't know. Emotionally, I don't know if I could. I think when it comes to like kind of the more natural method of burying it, mm -hmm. I think I might be able to. But the boiling it and ripping the flesh off, I, that I for sure could not do. Yeah. I guess for me, it would depend on how, how much time had passed between yeah. the time I had the pet um, and when I buried it back up. I mean, dug it back up. Like if it was mostly bones, do you think it would affect you as much? Or do you think it would be like the rotting flesh or the maggots? that would? Yeah, be, I think it's yeah. the, the decomposition. Yeah. Because they're kind of in that in-between period where they're exactly. like, yeah, I think exactly. that would bother me more too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Nikolai suggests that uh, some... Some disease, some animals may have diseases. It could. I guess it would depend on how your pet died, why your pet died. You know, you know and I think too, like, <clears throat> over, I would say the past couple of years, I've gotten a lot closer to, I mean, people often think of roadkill as incredibly like infested and filthy and this and that. And sometimes it is, but there's also sometimes where it's still relatively fresh, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying like, you know, there's a raccoon that's been horribly maimed and is bloody all over the street. Like there's obviously more ideal specimens than others. Um, but if you get the corpse quick enough before too much decomposition sets in, there's actually very little odor. Um, and you can start working on it or preparing it to be worked on pretty quickly. There's very little odor. And I mean, I wouldn't eat it personally. Right, right. I wouldn't put it in my mouth. I would wear gloves. I would be very sanitary. Um, but I think that like, I don't know. And I think we feel that way sometimes about human bodies too. Like this like pressure to be... Um, Oh, what's the word like preserved like for the formal like the preservation yeah. and like these airtight caskets like I think in the west we're so afraid of death mm -hmm. and just kind of slap it all with disease-ridden infection you know pathogens and like those I'm not saying those things are not part of it and are not real but I right. don't think that you know if a if someone or an animal or whatever passes it's not immediately a biohazard right 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 I agree. I agree. Death in in, in of itself, uh, all death isn't contamination and stuff like that. Not all death. I mean, uh, you know, if someone's taking a specific medication that could be harmful, 
to others or, you know, had a disease that was very contagious after death. That's very different than just someone dying. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, way back when people died and had the funerals right in their own home, they didn't, they weren't carted off somewhere. Yeah. Family prepared the body and everything. Well, yeah. And I would say too, like as an example, one of my friends recently um, at their mom's house, a squirrel crawled up underneath their mom's car and chose that place to die. You know, that death is very different than the, you know, I don't know, the squirrel that got hit by a car and has been baking in the hot summer sun for the past four days. Like those specimens would be very different. The, the yes. squirrels have frozen that chose to die up underneath the car. It also is an all one piece. Wow. So like there, I think, yeah, there's differences with um, yeah. what would make an ideal client to work with. Right. 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 Exactly. Um, hi, Shadow City. A lot of witches have a tool bag in their cart. They come across specimens. Yep. Human bodies. Ooh. That's human bodies can now be composted in Washington State as of January 2021. Yay! That's awesome. <laughs> it is. Um, so we got a four or five minutes. What do we want to cover in these four or five minutes? Well, I think to talk about like the toolkit, like mm. I think if we're talking specifically about, you know, procuring roadkill, like because mm -hmm. like there's travel altars and travel witchy bags mm -hmm. and all of that. But if we're specifically talking about the dead specimen thing that we've been talking about, I think that what your toolkit should have, I would um I would recommend some large size trash bags. I would recommend some gloves, disposable, not reusable, the disposable plastic gloves or whatever they are. Latex, if you can do latex, if not, get the other kind, the large bags. I would probably also get um, some sort of disinfectant, like maybe some disinfectant wipes. I would have some hand sanitizer. Um, you could also think about maybe having something to leave as an offering in the place of the body. You know, maybe like some bird seed or I don't know, whatever you feel like would be a good general offering to the spirits of the land. Mm -hmm. Even keeping a water bottle, maybe pouring that with some water, just like, you know, you could also think about just having like a, a container that closes that's roughly medium size that you could keep in your trunk that you can actually tie the bag with and place into the container. So then you can carry the box and you're not carrying a strange shaped animal in a bag. Um, that would probably be what comes to my mind first. I'm usually not that prepared. So I'll just be driving and be like, oh, cool. There's a squirrel three blocks from my house. And then I go home and then I get my stuff and then I go back out and hope that it's still there and it hasn't been destroyed too much. And then I throw my hazards on and I get out there in the street and I'll pick it up with the trap. Yeah, that's normally how I do it. But if you wanted to be more prepared than that, I, what would you put in the toolkit? Yeah, that all sounds good. I was also thinking like a, a shovel or a scoop of some kind um, in case, you know, depending on how bad the specimen is, it might be helpful depending on how big. I would say, you know, have an idea of how big you would go. Yeah, I don't think I would personally go much bigger than a raccoon. Yeah. Awesome. Also, just I was thinking that, but then, man, what if there was a dead deer? I might have to go get someone to um, go get that deer for me. Yeah, I would I, love, I would love to, I just know I couldn't transport it myself. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, I couldn't you know? either. And also like, I would have to also find someone to recruit to probably help me because I would imagine it would be pretty heavy. I and, know, right? Yeah, and my husband is not down with it. I mean, he yeah. supports me and loves that I love it. You know what I mean? And he thinks that the specimens are cool once they're done, but right. he's not really trying to be a part of that particular process. <laughs> and some of my friends, they humor me a lot. Even some of my witchy friends. I mean, they humor me. They love me. You know what I mean? Um, but they're not sticking their hands into a goat skull and ripping a tongue out. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would. 
I'm just thinking. Just come knock on the door. Hey, I've got another goat. Let's okay. Up. You got gloves for me? <laughs> yeah, I would. I don't. I don't know if I, I. I don't think I have big enough pots to boil a goat or goat. The goat. Yeah, I mean, the goat was first of all, it was a baby, so it was very small, and um, second of all, it was already butchered because it was from a halal butchery. Oh so yeah. Like, it wasn't all in one piece. It was the skull and then I got the legs. I didn't get the torso or anything, just the legs. Oh, oh, all right. Then you're already talking something that's already butchered. Oh hell, sure. Oh, yeah. I'm in. yeah, and it's halal. Yeah, right. So it's blood bloodless, right? Yeah. Yeah. Even more clean. I know exactly. I'm thinking all the icky stuff, you know. Oh, deers are beautiful. Don't think I could lift one my yeah, they're huge too. So but man, what if there was a dead deer? What if there was a dead deer on the side of the road? Uh-huh. And where you are, because you're in Washington now, right? Mm -hmm. Um, do you guys have moose out there? Or I've elk? never seen one. I elk, yeah, we've got bears. That would be cool. A dead bear on the side of the road. I have a bear baraculum somewhere on my desk. I'll see if I can find it and show it to you later. <laughs> Head cheese back in the day, yeah. Well, it is seven, so actually it's time for, for me to end the stream, um, but Jasmine and I are going to reschedule what we were going to talk about in the future. Uh, yeah. we, do wanna, we have a couple of topics we want to cover. So yeah, in a couple of weeks, I'll be live again. Not sure who I will be with, whether it's Jasmine or someone else, but thank you all for joining in. Happy birthday, Shadow City. Um, Thank you, Nikolai, for joining in in Montana. Yeah, I, I can't keep reading the comments because then I want to keep wanting to talk. But um, thank you all for joining. Uh, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks, everyone. Thank, thank you. For you. Love you all. Blessed be everyone.